It's 5.30. I'll call the meeting to order. And if everyone could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Before we get started, I'd like to give some instructions for tonight's meeting, we have uh, two public hearings scheduled. And in order to allow the public to comment in the hearing, uh, we've got the phone and also Facebook. Uh, we'll change the order of response uh, so that the public comments would be after the uh, commission questions. That'll allow Facebook, there is a little delay in broadcasting so that we can have the, any comments from the Facebook audience recorded and we can allow their comments to be included. Um, so we do have a phone number that you can enter in. Uh, it's one seven eight five two eight nine four seven. Two seven, and when you get there, you'll be asked to enter a conference ID number, and it is seven two zero nine five five four nine four, in the pound side. That'll let you enter in to the the conversation, and we'll have to we'll limit uh, public comments on any commission item to three minutes. So uh, with that, we'll. We're learning with the new technology and and the the social distancing requirements that we're with now, but we will uh, keep the meetings open and and modify as we need to allow the public interaction as we normally had. So with that, uh, next item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. I'll ask the commissioners if they've had a chance to review the agenda. I have, Mr. Mayor, and I have no uh, amendments this evening. I also have, Mayor, and I have no uh, additions. Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion that we adopt the agenda. I second it. Okay, motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Appointments to the Planning Commission, Board of Zoning Repeals. Uh, one expired term and applications are due April 30th. Uh, next item on the agenda is the public hearings. Our first public hearing is for amending the 2020 budget to include a new budgeted fund for transient guest tax. Uh, Mayor, this is the uh, hearing just setting that fund so that we can receive the funds that are now being um, sent directly to the city from the county and then pass through those to the chamber as indicated on the resolution that was previously passed. Okay. Any questions from the commission? I have none. Uh, no, the only thing I, I wanted to uh, clarify when I read through the resolution that was sent from the county commissioners, uh, they, are, they are the ones that are providing oversight uh, for the distribution of, of, or for the accounting of the funds, and they specified that they would um, look for a report from the chamber uh, by, fe uh, by February of the following year. Yes, I think uh, with the resolution it said the, as the money comes to us and is then distributed, then the report comes back to the commission for review, and then from here the commission would forward it to the county and the county is still in charge of administering and review of the funds also. Okay. I just want to make sure that you know, we all understood that. Yeah. Yeah. That's but, the way I understood it as well. Okay. So do we have any comments from the public? Okay. 
with that, then I'll close the public hearing and we'll uh, call for a motion. I move to approve the amended 2020 budget to include a new budgeted item for transient guest tax <laughs> as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Item B, public hearing to consider condemnation of the following structures as dangerous and unsafe. Uh, and I'll open this public hearing for 601 North 8th Street. Mayor, this is a residence that we have received multiple complaints about, and uh, <coughs> the house is currently uh, vacant. Uh, we have made attempts to contact the owner, and we have been unsuccessful. And uh, I would ask that you proceed with condemnation of this property. Okay. And is, is there a representative present for the owner? No. Uh, commissioners, do you have questions for staff concerning this property? Just one clarifying question, please, and that is that if the uh, if one of the bases for condemnation is neighbor complaints, do you record and maintain a log of neighborhood complaints against each property so that you have an understanding of how many individual complaints are received on a given property? Y yes, we do. I mean, it's this one is coming from this neighborhood and it's very specific in the complaints we're getting and uh, I've received them, the chief of police has received them, Kelly, and this has been an ongoing. Uh, typically when we receive a complaint, we address it fairly quickly and we're you typically usually able to get a hold of the owners and work through that. This is one of those where we're getting no reply from them and getting any feedback from them. So that kind of makes it a little more difficult to where in, in some of them we could go do inspections and try to proceed and do different things and we have been unsuccessful with this one. As a, as a position to defend, um, uh, accurate, uh, an accurate number of complaints might be more weighty than a, a, a vague uh, reference to uh, to a number of complaints though. Would you agree? I agree. Okay. Thank you. No, I've, I've had a chance to look at the property from a previous mention, so I'm good. So with the complaint though, you went and, and with your review, you determined that uh, there's structural issues and security issues that warrant Yes, we've actually been dealing with this for over a year with other issues when it was occupied and I don't want to go into all those details, but there's been ongoing issues both on my side, the police department side with this property for over a year. It then became vacant and has proceeded to this point, Mayor. Okay. Were there any questions from Facebook or no. phone call? Okay, with no other questions, and I'll close the hearing, and then at this time, I'll uh, call for a motion concerning 601 North 8th Street. I move that 601 North 8th Street be condemned as dangerous as and unsafe. Second it. I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. We'll now proceed and open the public hearing for 1008 West Laurel Street. Mayor, this house was involved in a structure fire a couple of months ago. Uh, the property belongs to Odessa Dunn and she has been very responsive to us. Uh, she. The property did have insurance. She has worked with her insurance agent and it is under repairs. The electrical work has been done. Now the carpenters are doing the sheetrock and uh, rebuilding the kitchen. Uh, she's proceeding at a good pace and uh, we would ask that we adjourn this for 60 days to allow her time to finish the repairs of the house, at which time we will do the inspection and I 
anticipate she will pass and reoccupy the house. Okay. And Mrs. Dunn is not present. And I, do you have any record of her logging in on Facebook or any? Okay. I, Mayor, I will say I have con I visited with her last week. She's aware, <laughs> and since we were adjourning the meeting, she was not going to be present. Okay. Or since I was requesting to adjourn the meeting. Any questions from the commission? I have none. I have none, Mayor. And then, uh, are there any citizen questions presented? No. Okay. With that, then I'll close the public hearing and uh, call for a motion. I move that the hearing for 1008 West Laurel be adjourned until 5.30 p.m. June 25th, 2020. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. We had no modifications to the consent agenda, so at this time I'll call for a motion. I make a motion that we adopt the consent agenda. I second it. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Items for commission action. Consider proclaiming April as Fair, Fair Housing Month. Mayor, this is the proclamation that is adopted every year. And um, so we're just asking that you adopt it again for this year. Okay. Commissioners, have any questions concerning the proclamation? Uh, I'm just curious, since I'm new to the commission, how many uh, years have we celebrated uh, Fair Housing Month? Well, as many as I can remember. <laughs> if That's you would like me to do some research, I'd be happy to do that. As many, many as you can remember would be a lot. Okay, a lot of yeah. years, wouldn't it? <laughs> I was just curious. There is need, no need for further research. Thank you. I'm good. So with that, then I'll call for a motion. I move to authorize the mayor to sign the attached proclamation declaring April 2020 as Fair Housing Month. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. And the proclamation reads, whereas the Congress of the United States passed the Civil Rights Act of 1968, of which Title VIII declared that the law of the land should now guarantee the rights of equal housing opportunity, and whereas the City of Independence is committed to the mission and intent of Congress to provide fair and equal housing opportunities for all, and today many Realty companies and associations support fair housing laws. And whereas the fair housing groups and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development have over the years received thousands of complaints of alleged illegal housing discrimination and found too many that have proved upon investigation to be violations of the fair housing laws. And whereas equal housing opportunity is a condition of life in our city that can and should be achieved. Now therefore, be it resolved, the mayor of the City of Independence hereby declares the month of April as Fair Housing Month. Item B, consider proposal for the annual fireworks display. Mayor, we have Jim Kelly on the line who can cover this item. How are you this evening, Jim? I'm doing good, Mayor. Would you like to uh, share what we've discussed and, and the plans for the fireworks display? I, I will. The uh, fireworks display, uh, as we've discussed, the initial hope that it's on July the 4th, and uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the display will be uh, uh, presented by the same company, Rainbow Fireworks out of Inman, Kansas. And we asked for two options on it. One, an option for the same price as last year. And then what the option would be to take the shell count back uh, the same as it was last year. And so the, the option 
uh, to keep the show the same of, as it was last year, which was $15,650, cut down the shell count by 71 shells, and generally some of the larger shells, at a cost of $1,050. So uh, it's being, uh, the initial contract is presented as uh, in the amount of last year's show, $15,650. And uh, then if the uh, additional 1,050 could be raised uh, as the, uh, the city was uh, committing for the $15,650 that we could go up the shell count. Well, before the e meeting uh, tonight at all, as uh, someone that evidently read the agenda, um, Mike Thompson and his wife Karen contacted me and said they will pay the, they will donate the additional $1,050 so that uh, the shell count can be the same as it was last year. So that thing, that that was an option has been uh, has been covered. So we'd have a show with the same shell count as last year, and then we discussed earlier uh, uh, in a uh, conversation that we wanted to have we wanted to check about if we had to delay the show because of the pandemic, in case there was still. Uh, issues related to that was it possible and uh, could the backup date be farther down the line than july the 5th as normal since uh, nothing's going to change in a day and uh, and if that if uh, the uh, day that we picked later didn't work because of the pandemic could the down payment uh, carry over to next year's show and uh, the answer to all of those is yes, uh, we can delay out to an example would be Labor Day, which some of the other shows are picking because it's a holiday weekend. Uh, uh, we could delay to Labor Day. And if the pandemic uh, reared its ugly head again uh, in the fall, as some predictions have it, uh, we could delay it till next year and the down payment would be applied against next year's show. And the contract, uh, uh, city attorney Jeff Chubb modified the contract and uh, I sent it to uh, Rainbow Fireworks and they replied just about 45 minutes ago that the changes were fine with them and uh, that Jeff had made. So they don't have any problem with the contract uh, the only thing that we will uh, more than likely have to do from my discussion with them, and it's not in the contract, but it was in, it, in the cover letter about the length of time that we would have to add the additional shells that we would have until June 20th to tell them we needed the additional shells because they actually load, get to the show ready and, and trailered and, and get the shells out because they make lots of distributions around the area. And they uh, had indicated if the pandemic is the reason, uh, they would also like to know that by June the 20th. So they don't do all of that work and they hold it until the period of time that we are going to do the show on a backup date. So like I said, that's not in the contract, but that's that was in uh, my conversation with him uh, after he had said uh, the uh, everything looked okay, and that's probably that's probably fairly reasonable because that's not very long out. Uh, we should know uh, by then, and and I'm sure if it doesn't, they they were very good to work with on this. Yeah, they've been real good to service the city on the fireworks display, and even. Uh, a couple years ago, um, did they cut the fee or they, they gave us some compensation for what they felt wasn't uh, a good show, if I remember yes. right? Yeah, they did. So the fireworks. 
the contract has been revised to include that June 20th date mm -hmm. um, just just about an hour before the meeting Jeff added that in yes and as I mentioned he was he was fine with the revised contract okay. uh, commissioners do you have any question for mr. Kelly I do not uh, does uh, weather play a factor into that on those uh, the dates in other words yeah, if it's but at, at also normal we can we can reschedule for weather and uh, we've never had to do it in the uh, since 1991 when uh, I've been involved with it we haven't had to reschedule we've canceled once in the flood of I think of 2007 because it just couldn't be held and we actually carried that over to next year to the next year but if we reschedule because of weather you're usually at a point when that happens that it's the day of the show so they like to have the show rescheduled for the next day because all the shells are on the ground and loaded uh, generally by the time you make that call so uh, but that that's always been there and that would still be the same all right thank you Jim and there is a note in the uh, RCA that in it reads in honor of Independence's 150th birthday celebration this summer and in recognition of the financial struggles of our businesses and residents due to the COVID-19 pandemic the recommendation is not to seek donations this year, but it would, the, the expense would be covered by the city. So we're just trying to allow our, our citizens a break from dealing with the restrictions of the pandemic and any economic strain that they're going through and have a time just to relax and enjoy the 4th of July as we have in the past. So, uh, we do have a committed uh, donor for the $1,050, so it is possible to increase the show to the original size. That would make the contract, if I'm, my addition is correct, $16,700. Does that sound right? So uh, I, I believe that sounds right. So then uh, at this time, as we seek a motion, we can modify the contract amount at this in, in one act. So at this time, I'll call for a motion. Okay, I make a motion that we hold on here a minute. <clears throat> I make a motion that we move to authorize the mayor to sign an agreement with Rainbow Fireworks Incorporated for the 4th of July fireworks show in the amount of $15,650, subject to city attorney approval. Would you like to uh, uh, revise your uh, cost to $16,700? Is, is that the uh, revised amount? Yeah. Okay, with the donation. Okay, I didn't catch that. Okay, let me reread that. I move to authorize the mayor to sign an agreement with Rainbow Fireworks Incorporated for the 4th of July fireworks show in the amount of $16,700, subject to city attorney approval. Second it. Here we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate all your work. Thank you, well, Jim. Well, thank you very much, and I think we're... Uh, with uh, the city's generosity and Mike and Karen Thompson, we'll have a, a really good show again. Good way to celebrate the ending of this. It is. It is. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, item C, consider change orders 1, 2, 4, 6, and 7 regarding the 1960 City Hall project. I believe Vance is on the phone and is he in there also yeah they should both be on mayor yep i'm here that's as well. correct mayor okay so we'll
proceed. I think maybe uh, what we'll do is just kind of go through each change order item. Uh, yesterday I had a chance to visit with Vance and Ian about the change orders and one of the things I suggested is that it be for the final acceptance be submitted on a standard AIA change order form that would list the contract amount and it, it documents all the change orders so at the end you have a total contract amount as it's revised as we add change orders or as we get deduct change orders and it's uh, an easy process for us to follow through with total project costs and also if there's any days to extend or reduce from the contract amount so and they they had a I believe you had agreed to submit it in final form on a AIA document am I correct Vance? Yes, yes, Mayor, that is correct. Okay. We will document it on the AIA change order form. Okay. So our, our first change order was for the add of windows not identified on the plans. This is a material only change order. Uh, Vance or Ian, do you want to give a little background to the commission? Yeah, this is Ian. I can I can uh, go over this one. Um, this uh, change order arose due to a discrepancy uh, on the drawings uh, and uh, covers uh, eleven windows that uh, were not included in the contractor's original bid uh, due to the due to the discrepancy. Um, they, uh, we were told that they had provided the uh, window schedule to the uh, manufacturer and that was what the bid for the windows was prepared off of and there were these 11 windows that were covered on the, the uh, plans and elevations but were not uh, included in the window schedule. So. They didn't get included in the bid. Now, over the course of talking with the contractor and the city about this, we've uh, gone back to the contractor and and said, look, the the overall scope for this project was very clear from the beginning that all of the windows were being replaced and it is an existing building. So they did have access to the building to see all the windows that were uh, existing. So. Um, it was our opinion then that uh, the city does need to pay for the, the windows because they would have been included in the overall scope regardless, um, but we thought that it wasn't fair that they, they also pay the labor and the contractor's overhead and profit on, the, on those windows. So um, this is what we agreed to was to just have it be a uh, straight material cost for for the windows uh, to get them covered and, and included in the scope of the project. And yesterday when we were visiting, I presented to Vance and, and Ian, you'll notice uh, windows on the south first floor they're identical to the three windows on the north and uh, it seemed like to me that as they were doing the estimate and and getting prepared that the question should have come up in the subcontractor that was reviewing the project that the windows being identical that the transom windows, the upper windows, and the cladding should have been figured since they were similar. Um, and, and I was asking that they revisit re with the contractor to get an explanation of how 
if the windows were same, because you'll look at the other two windows are remote located and are, are different than these, but these are identical to uh, the large windows on the north. Uh, so for your review, commissioners, do you have any questions regarding change order one that you would no. ask or? I think that's a fair balance uh, as far as what Vance has, has come up with, and, and you've talked to Vance already that you've mentioned. Uh, it was just uh, an oversight by the contractor and uh, that we should, uh, we would be paying for the windows anyway, mm -hmm. but we're excluding the overhead and profit uh, on those items, which, mm -hmm. which is reasonable. That's something they should have realized and caught and it was overlooked. So we just shouldn't be penalized for something that they've overlooked. So I'm agreeable with that. I'm good on change order one. Okay. The next change order was a credit for demo work in the basement uh, completed by remediation subcontractor. That was early in the project. Uh, I think during some abatement that it switched from the contract with Hofer and Hofer to the abatement contractor. Um, the change order four is for time and material estimate for all labor material and equipment to demo the damaged wood window frames in repair or replace wood window frames with blocking for installation of new replacement windows. Ian, do you want to explain that to the commission? Yeah, so this one uh, is one that's arisen due to uh, unforeseen conditions. Um, when we did our initial uh, site assessment on the building, um, we had assumed, uh, based on what we could see at the time, that uh, all of the historic uh, wood frame components would still be in place on the majority of the windows, and that was what we then based our our details in the construction documents on. And uh, what occurred then was that as the contractor has uh, begun opening up uh, some of these windows by taking out the vinyl replacement windows that are in them currently, uh, they have uh, found that the uh, when the vinyl windows were, were installed, in a lot of cases, the uh, historic wood frames were removed and in some cases very roughly it almost looks like they were uh, literally hacked out um, and uh, no one is quite sure why this isn't isn't a typical way that replacement windows uh, are installed in historic openings uh, typically they just remove the sat the historic uh, wood sashes and uh, the uh, parting stop between those sashes and then uh, leave the historic uh, frame components in place and use that as the mounting for the, the replacement windows. So this was, this was unexpected uh, uh, to everyone involved. And so uh, what, what uh, this change order is covering then would be uh, the time and material uh, work that uh, we have agreed with the, the contractor to cover this um, so that they can scale the amount of new blocking required to what's actually missing from each window as they, they remove it. Um, and this process would be documented uh, by the city uh, with photographs. Uh, the contractor will also be taking their own photographs so that, that way we have a clear picture of just how much work was required um, and then we'll be able to correlate that with the time and material receipts that we received from the contractor as part of their, their pay applications moving forward in the project as they start uh, on this uh, window replacement. So um, the way that we, we picture handling this then is that this is this this change order covers the contractor's uh, total estimated amount based on what they've seen in the field so far, looking at the few windows they have removed for, 
preparing the shop drawings and getting final measurements on the openings. And uh, uh, then once, once they have completed the work, then if there's a credit to be had back on this amount, we can process that then as another change order at the end of the project. So this is the maximum not to exceed. So it could come Correct. in less, and that's where we would have another change order modifying the final cost for the work. But it, it will not e exceed the $43,297.50, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner's questions? I have none. I have none, Mayor. Okay, uh, item six, uh, change order six is the lintel repairs for basement windows, including all labor, material, and equipment. Ian, would you want to explain this Yeah, statement? this one was uh, another unforeseen uh, condition that arose as the, uh, the uh, masons started working on the replacement of the, the basement lentils. Um, uh, it included in the original uh, contract amount for this project was the alternate that we had uh, developed uh, with the original construction documents to uh, replace the corroded steel plate that is part of these basement uh, window lentils and uh, that required taking out the, the stone lintel above the window uh, to remove as much of that corroded plate as possible to prevent further, further damage to the, the masonry from the, the corrosion, and then install a new stainless steel angle to replace whatever load that uh, uh, plate may have been carrying as, as part of this uh, steel and stone masonry lintel system above the window and then reinstall the, the stone lintel and, and repoint. Um, as the masons removed the stone lintels, they found that the main portion of this historic steel lintel behind, uh, embedded within the wall, was uh, actually completely corroded, and uh, in a lot of cases, just completely gone. Uh, my, my best guess, the mason's best guess, was just over time, due to open joints in the masonry, there's just been a lot of water uh, coming down through the interior of that wall, uh, causing this, this kind of corrosion. Uh, so, but no, no one has ever seen anything like this, this before either, uh, as, far, as far as this extent of deterioration of something embedded in a wall before. So, um, we had our structural engineer out on the site in January to take a look at this because it, it was concerning. And uh, he determined that the best course of action would be to uh, go ahead and, and get as much of this, the, the entirety of this historic lintel that's corroded out, get as much of that corroded steel out as possible to prevent further deterioration of the masonry, and then replace the the channel uh, in kind with a uh, stainless steel channel and then continue with the originally included work of the uh, stainless steel angle to uh, replace the, the plate underneath the, uh, the stone lintel. Um, so that, that's the course of action that we agree with as well. That's uh, the safest in the long run, we believe, uh, to prevent, as our structural engineer said in his letter, inadvertently changing the load paths within the wall and uh, potentially causing a future maintenance issue with uh, any shifting that occurs in the masonry and potential, potential cracks that could, could end up forming in these lentils. So uh, We also uh, had uh, initially the, the change order had uh, 62,000 was the, the total amount on it, which seemed uh, quite high to us. And we went back with, with our structural engineer uh, to the Masons and we uh, discovered that that was due to some of the 
uh, means and methods with their uh, shoring methods that they had included. So um, we determined that that extent wasn't wasn't going to be necessary, and so they uh, revised it down to 24,702 uh, for this change order um, with some less intensive uh, shoring methods. Any questions for Ian concerning change order six? I have none. I have none, Mayor. Okay. Change order seven, deletion of the east roof. Uh, uh, yeah. This change order uh, was yet another unforeseen condition um, with the uh, east uh, apparatus bay addition roof. Um, as the roofer uh, began working on his demolition of the existing uh, roofing membrane on that roof, um, he found that the uh, poured gypsum or lightweight uh, concrete product uh, that had been applied over the steel decking uh, on that, that roof structural system uh, was in very poor condition and was actually pulling up in large chunks as uh, he was pulling off the existing roof membrane. Um, so that was another uh, instance that we had our structural engineer look at in January when he was there and uh, he determined that the, the poured system was not part of the actual structural system of that roof. Um, and so we had options uh, we could explore as far as uh, repair uh, and installing a new roof. Uh, but with the uncertainties around uh, what extent of addition may be required uh, around the building for the phase two project, we decided that the best best course of action was to just hold on any repair work and replacement to this roof and uh, roll that into the phase two of the project once once we know uh, whether this addition will be remaining, whether we're going to be replacing it with part of a larger addition. Uh, and so this change order then includes the uh, credit of the roofer's labor, and the roofer has agreed that he'll be uh, giving the materials to the uh, city for use in the uh, future addition roof. And did this include the cap flashing and wall flashing? Uh, no, I uh, asked the contractor about that today, and, and he called the, uh, the roofer. The roofer said that uh, he was apologetic. He had assumed that we would want to go ahead and have this uh, cap uh, be consistent uh, in appearance with the uh, cap that will be applied to the main part of the building. Uh, and uh, so he had assumed we would still be proceeding with that. Uh, my intent was that we just didn't do anything to this, this roof and uh, uh, not have to potentially rework work anything with it. So the roofer did say that it would be plus or minus another $1,500 in savings uh, if, if he doesn't install that, that cap flashing. Yeah, the, the cap flashing shouldn't be installed for us to have to take it off and potentially ruin it for no reason. So, and 1500 sounds a little light for labor and material of the cap flashing for the north and the east wall. You had manufactured cap flashing, not brake metal, didn't you? Correct. Yeah, it was. Uh, it would. It would have been a manufactured product. Yeah. And Mayor, this is this is Vance. Um, because of the late information, what we were suggesting is to move forward with this deduct, and then we'll return with a follow-up change order to cover the appropriate costs for not including that uh, cap flashing. Right. As long as we document this that it didn't include the cap flashing, that would be the, the way to proceed. 
that come back then with an additional deduct change order for the cap flashing and the wall flashing. So, so this is the items that he says material is roof membrane and insulation, no flashing. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Questions from the commission? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have just one question that involves the entirety of the change order package that we're considering this evening, and that is that uh, this package being um, a $78,000 additional cost, what, uh, what portions of the uh, work uh, that uh, remains to be done uh, have the potential for uncovering this type of uh, change order, or are you to the point of uh, in the project that you can say that you have uncovered all of the unknowns? Do you understand my question? Yes, I do. Uh, at, at this point, I, and Vance, Vance can correct me if he thinks otherwise, I, I, I believe that we have seen all of the conditions that are, are potentially unknown um, because the the masons have, have nearly wrapped up their their work on the exterior masonry other than the, the issue with the basement lintels and uh, as far as the re rest of the scope of work the the roofer has completed uh, half of the, the re-roofing he has the the base membrane down on the the upper roof that was another area that we uh, knew there may be some some issues uh, with the uh, the concrete deck of, of the roof, but the roofer didn't find any uh, when he tore off the existing roof. So um, between the the lentils and the windows, we've uncovered the, the majority of the areas that would be expected to have have unforeseen conditions. I agree. Thank you, guys. Uh, it would it's not uncommon for you to. Uh, report a, a percentage complete of the project. Uh, do you have uh, a current assessment of percentage complete of this project? Um, yes, the uh, most recent change order, I believe, uh, or sorry, the most recent pay app, I believe, uh, listed the project out at a uh, little over uh, halfway complete and uh, I'm in agreement with that. Uh, the majority of the, the remaining cost is the uh, uh, cost of the windows, which uh, we're still waiting for the, those to be ordered. Um, there's a sample uh, corner of a window that was uh, produced by the manufacturer so that uh, we could confirm, the contractor can confirm final installation fit uh, with the way that they're installing the blocking and uh, there was a mix-up in the shipping on that, so we're still waiting for that to get to the site for final final confirmation on the, the that the shop drawings are are adequate to uh, release the windows for manufacturing. So, with the window installation, there's no potential for a change order there. It's pretty cut and dried now that they've got the rough framing done. That the windows will fit, and we won't have another change order for panning system or anything like that, will we? Correct, yeah. The the panning system, all of that was included in, in the original bid uh, as part of the, the construction documents. Okay. Okay, Vance, I, I have a question. This is Lewis, uh, Commissioner Isusi. Um, on, the, on the windows, do you um, anticipate uh, possible delay of the manufacture and shipping of those windows due to, uh, you know, what we're facing uh, health-wise as a country? You anticipate some issues there that would kick us further down the road? So, Commissioner, right, right now what we're seeing is that um, the construction industry is being considered an essential service. And so material suppliers and manufacturers are still producing their product. And as what we've been told by the contractor, they anticipate that these windows will not be delayed at this time. 
Now, I, I can tell you if we were to see a spike or if we were to see cases of COVID-19 within that manufacturing plant, then we would be uh, coming back and, and discussing what would, what would happen from a time perspective. All right, I, I understand that. Uh, basing uh, that information, uh, if everything holds true, and those windows are manufactured and sent out to us, uh, what is the time frame that you're looking at as far as a delivery, and then just an estimated time as far as uh, window work actually proceeding, and then the windows actually uh, being put in and completed, some idea of a time span? If you can. Uh, the, the contractors told us that uh, currently with the, the schedule at the, at the window manufacturer that once they yeah. release them for manufacturing, it'd be about eight weeks until the windows uh, start arriving on site, but they expect that the actual installation will go very quickly uh, once they do, do arrive. All right. Thank you. So any other questions concerning the change order items? I have none. Uh, I didn't notice any request for extension, so this is all going to be completed in its original uh, contract time frame, isn't it? Yes, as, as, of, this, as of this time, they don't, don't see that uh, any of these are, are affecting the, the completion per the original time frame. Yeah, I think we were quite generous in giving him over 400 days to complete the work, and it's kind of slow going on, and uh, I'd hate to see it extended beyond what our contract has already stated. So um, if there's no further questions from the commission, then uh, Vance or Ian, do you have any questions or further comment to the commission? No, sir. No. We're, we're here to answer your questions. Okay, then at, at this time, I'll call for a motion. I move to approve the change orders one, two, four, six, and seven for a total of seventy-eight thousand seventy-eight dollars and fifty cents for the nineteen sixteen City Hall Phase One project. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you, Vance. Thank you, Ian. You're welcome. Thank you, gentlemen. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consider a partial split for city-owned property located north of West Maple Street, west of Auction Street and east of South 22nd Street. Uh, Kelly? Uh, Mayor, this is a lot that is just one um, portion of it of in the northwest uh, corner of the lot, as you can see up there, is uh, encroached by the floodplain, which means this entire parcel has to come in to uh, the restrictions of the the flood ordinance and different things on structures and elevation and all of that. Um, so what we did is we had, um, let me get down here to get to the next slide. I had the um, surveying company survey that for us so that uh, we could get that separated. So is the actual floodplain just that pink? Yes. Strip. Well, actually, that is the, the, the fringe of it. Sorry, let me get here. Yeah. So, um, so the, the gray part is the 100-year floodplain. This is kind of what they call the fringe. Oh, okay. And so what he did is here it shows the flood line is here. But I told him to go a little bit beyond that just in case it's off a little bit. I mm -hmm. guess we call that wiggle room. Mm -hmm. So, and so we did that, and so that's the lot split. So you have one parcel that's 0.258 acres, and the remaining 1.207 acres, which is would be free to develop without those restrictions. Okay. 
And if you look at the sanitation lot, you can see the, a lot of that is in that flood zone. So we wouldn't be able to develop this. I mean, I guess we could separate a little piece of this, but even that building is, is kind of encroached. So if we wanted to do anything in the future, we wouldn't have a lot of room there. So this would give us more options. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any questions from the commission? I have none. I have none, Mayor. If there are no further questions, then I'll entertain a motion. I move that the parcel split as prepared by Cornerstone Surveying for City-Owned Property located north of West Maple Street, west of Auction Street, and east of South 22nd Street be filed with Montgomery County. Second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Uh, next item, item E. Consider setting the date of June 25th, 2020 for public hearings to consider condemnation as dangerous and unsafe of the following fire damage structures. One, 1,000 or 208 North 6th Street, and property two is 816 East Magnolia Street. David? Mayor, since both of these structures were recently involved in uh, structure fires, uh, both of them were destroyed and are unhabitable. Uh, I can tell you that 1208 North 6th Street, the owner is proceeding with demo, and I anticipate by the time the hearing comes, that property will already be removed. Uh, 816 East Magnolia, I have made contact with the owner. Uh, she's aware of the process that is starting and uh, she did not give me, me any indication if she had the means or what they were going to do at this point, but she's aware that there will be a hearing in two months. I would ask the commission to move to set the hearing, please. Okay. Um, questions from the commission? I have none. I have none, Mayor. Okay, so I'll entertain a, a motion. I move to adopt resolution setting the date of Ju June 25th, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. for public hearings to consider condemnation of 1208 North 6th Street and 816 East Magnolia Street. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Item, item F, consider awarding demolition bids received on the following condemned structures. I, property one is 325 North 19th Street. Property two, 305 South Burns Street. Three is 713 East Magnolia Street. Four. 816 South 17th Street, 5 is 317 South 14th Street, 6, 305 South 18th Street, 7, 208 North 17th Street, 8, 904 West Main Street, 9 is 301 Cement Street, 10, 613 West Chestnut Street, 11 is uh, 112 West Chestnut Street. Mayor, these are houses that we have been in our condemnation uh, process over the last year. Uh, our building committee, as you're aware, started a new process last year where we work with the county appraiser's office and we receive uh, a list of houses that are unsound and these properties have went through a complete process over the last year. Uh, these bids were sent out several months ago and received prior to the COVID-19 event. Uh, as you know, the uh, demolition fund is a fund that is uh, 50,000 comes from housing and then the city puts in 50,000. Mm -hmm. uh, we have funds accumulated in that fund and these are actually funds that have been encumbered from 2019. Uh, I would also make it aware that we're asking that 325 North 19th Street be removed from this bid list. Uh, it has a new owner. That owner has been working with me, has provided a timeline and to repair this house. 
and it is our effort and I believe the Commission's effort to save housing if possible this house is can be saved similar to what a recent group did in town in that area so uh, she knows she has a year and she I believe she'll be able to complete that so we're asking that 325 North 19th be removed from the list but I would ask that the Commission approve awarding the demolition to JRB for the other houses okay with uh That one being removed, it looked like the low bidder had still included it in his total price. So does that change the $51,500? I believe I subtracted that out. Prior to when we received the bid, what happened is the COVID. So we're, we're right at the 30 days. This has all transpired in the last month with 325 North 19th. Mm -hmm. So that's why his bid included 325 North 19th. Mm -hmm. And I believe I subtracted it out correctly. What you saw is in the, if he got all 11 structures, he was given a discount on all the structures if he got all 11, but he didn't get all 11. And so that's what the difference is. So he got 10. He got 10. But what you could do is, is authorize a not to exceed amount up to that. And we could go back to him since he's getting 10 and ask him if he would give us that reduction since he's getting 10 of them. Um, but he had given us a discount on his bid form if he got all 11 structures. Yeah, because he, he said on his bid form that he was deducting $57 from each bid if he got all of them. Yes. But that's still, he still left. Got over $3,400 for 325 North 19th. So right. it seemed like we should be able to negotiate a, some of that money out. Yeah, so what you could do is, is authorize a not to exceed up to that. We could go back and see if he'll give us that discount on those other 10. Yeah. All we could do is ask. Do you? Commissioners see what I was talking about. Indeed, and uh, just to clarify, the 51500 that is indicated in the motion does not exceed the original contract bid for 325 North 19th. It does not include that. That does not include it. That's taking the individual amounts and adding them together without the discount that he added only if he got all 11 structures. Okay. So you took the 3500 out of the... 5,500 instead yes. of, and I, then I was looking at the, if he gets 10, that we'd still get the 57 off of the 10. Yeah, but his note said only if he got all 11 structures. Yeah, and that was because there were no notice of, I, I'd say negotiate. Yes. Set it as a maximum and, and see, because he's, he would still be getting money for work right. that he didn't is uh, they've done work for the city before haven't yes. they okay not the one we had issues with is it uh, no uh, if you're talking about last year yeah no no okay this is not that contract yeah I don't remember seeing the, oh yeah, yeah, he's, he's yeah. done good work. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So in our motion, we should indicate it as a not to exceed then. So if there's no further questions from the commission, I'll entertain a motion. I move to award the demolition bid to JRB Industries for a total not to exceed $51,500 for the removal of 10 structures as listed, excluding 325 North 19th Street. I second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Item G, consider authorizing a grant agreement in the amount of $20,000 for the Independence Municipal Airport from the CARES Act. Um, Kelly, would you like to explain? Yeah, this is probably the easiest grant that we've 
ever had the even sent us the application already filled out. The only thing I had to change is they had me as a mister instead of a <laughs> <laughs> But um, it's basically part of the CARES Act for operation for airports that was in that. And, and because of the type of, of um, airport that we have and level of traffic, traffic they have is designated for $20,000. So all we have to do is just sign this, send it back in, and we'll use it for operations. Okay. It is pretty simple. It was very simple. Yeah. There um, are no after the fact uh, compliance issues with this? There are compliance issues depending on if there's other things you can use it for like debt repayment or there were other options but if you're just going to use it for like payroll and utilities and things like that then then which is not going to be an issue so. I was curious about the follow-up reporting, if there's a, a lot of that or not. It, it doesn't appear to be so. I can check into that further, but it seems to be a pretty um, simple grant. And our reporting, I mean, through our budgeting, our line items, it would be very easy to show that that money was spent for payroll and utilities and things like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Susie? I'm good. Okay. If there's no further questions from the commission, then I'll call for a motion. I move to authorize the acting city manager to sign a CARES Act grant agreement in the amount of $20,000 for the continue oper continued operations of the Independence Municipal Airport. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Okay, next item on the Agenda is discussions. Item A is discuss the process of renewing the special use sales tax. I think. Would you like me to review this? Do what? Would you like me to review it? Yeah. Okay, so this is the uh, ballot language that we had, and I'll make it a little bigger, um, that we had on the original special use sales tax that was passed on April 3rd. Um, approved 79% to 21%, and it um, will expire on October 1st, 2022. And I contacted um, Gilmore Bell, who has helped us in the past on our ballots, and they have determined that this is the process that would need to be followed to renew that. The commission first needs to determine the language that they want to include on the ballot. And then once you do that, the bond council will prepare a resolution setting the election date and specific question, a notice of election which the county uh, publishes and a ballot. Um, the resolution will need to be adopted by the commission within 90 days of the election date, which 90 days prior to the election date of November 3rd is August 5th. So the bond council suggests adopting the resolution at either the August 13th or August 27th commission meetings. And then at that point, the bond council would coordinate with publication of the notice of election with the county clerk. And then the special use uh, sales tax ballot question would appear on the November 3rd uh, election. So that is the process. Okay. And then Lacey provided you some information on uh, collection on the sales tax that's in your packet. Yeah. I'd ask uh, Lacey to kind of give us an idea how much money had been generated in the special use sales tax and then also um, for each quarter or 25 percent of of the the bond that had been or the sales tax that had been used for the different areas uh, debt repayment and mill levy support the building and facility improvements improvements of streets and sidewalks and the ada so um, that kind of gives us an idea of what money was looked at then. There could be a, a change in the revenue um, from the effect of the COVID-19, but this does give us an idea of how much money had been coming in in the past. I also asked her for the um, a list of, of bonds and that were covered under the uh, bond and debt repayment. So give us an idea of what we're committed to in the 
special use sales tax going forward because if if it didn't pass then that money's going to have to come from general fund um, what what i thought is we're approaching this time we have a a time to look at a restructuring or how we want to uh, look at use should the special use sales tax continue you know some projects uh, I uh, maybe look at if a portion of it went to uh, the economic development fund that would supplement our our uh, franchise tax that generates in there so we'd have a little more uh, funds to look at at investing in existing businesses or in in, in looking to new businesses um, the, the rec commission had come to us about some property to relocate the soccer fields and i thought maybe you know to to reach out and work with them to include a renovation of uh, of the ballparks and look at a, a sports complex in the area that could be funded through the sales tax uh, you know with uh, with things of our our health care it wasn't too long ago we were in panic mode of the announcement of mercy closing but again looking at the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic, how that's affected our health care. Maybe, you know, have a fund that money could go from the special use sales tax to a health care that would allow, you know, supporting equipment, supporting operating expenses of our, our health care providers, you know, some way similar to the Economic Development Fund, but, uh, a separate item addressing health care. We know how important health care is and, and just the uh, uneasy time until we got the ER established, people considering relocating and how it affects our businesses. One thing Kelly had brought up uh, with Memorial Hall, some of the expenses that we have ongoing here, uh, curtain, Fireproofing, uh, you rigging, might share some of that. Rigging system, smoke hatch. It's just, it, it, it costs quite a bit to keep all of that up. This is a very big building and, mm -hmm. and a lot of the quality of life stuff, you know, some of it would having to do some chiller repairs, things like that. Yeah, it, we use the quality of life funds that was left for doing some maintenance, but going forward, yeah, we're looking mechanical systems here the the repair costs are very expensive the library we're going to be approaching a life on on the library that we could start entering into some uh, mechanical repairs uh, and then also you know with the the swimming pool uh, terry had shared some problems of getting some pumps so our quality of life projects are starting to show signs of age and as we look at reinitiating or presenting the special use sales tax for a vote looking at including some of these projects and shifting some money from the streets the the ada but uh, you know with this information it gives us an idea of what money had been generated but i thought maybe we'd want to look shortly at a, a work session to work with staff and kind of brainstorm some of these items. Uh, I don't know what the thoughts of the commission are, so commissioners? Well, I think the conversation is timely. Uh, we need to get busy on this. The, uh, the um, special use sales tax uh, will be running out and that means that we will either have to do something on this or we'll, we'll have to raise property taxes. So it's, uh, it's time to get started, uh, but it'd be, uh, 
I'd say it'd be a worthy effort to uh, specify where the funds are going to go to uh, develop a list of projects that uh, the, uh, the voters can be excited about supporting with their vote to continue this type of mm -hmm. uh, sales tax. So absolutely, we should meet. Mm -hmm. yeah, I thought the more specific projects could be included, it does get that benefit factor aware. Commissioner Yasusi? Well, I, I think that's a good idea. Um, the current special use sales tax has paid for a lot of improvements, ADA streets, uh, bond debt reduction, uh, mill levy relief. So it's provided a lot of improvements to the city that we wouldn't uh, be able to do if we didn't have the special use sales tax. Uh, most of these projects probably would not happen because we would be forced to find another source of funding if we wanted to uh, continue to work on these projects. And that would fall back to um, your ad valorem taxes, which are just not, um, just not feasible. Um, you know, everybody has their own ideas about taxes. Uh, some people consider them a necessary evil. But to continue uh, with what you have in the city, it's, it's a continual process that you have to uh, keep your facilities up. You still have to maintain streets and sewer lines and water lines and everything associated with that. And uh, you can't just um, turn a blind eye to that uh, because the results, uh, you see what happens when you don't do those things. And we've been playing catch up here uh, the last couple of years with uh, trying to be more um, reactive to a lot of the situations that have come before us, trying to be ahead of the curve where we can to where we've been able to stay on top of some of these things. But, but there's a limit to that. Uh, but it's something that I'm, I'm glad we're going to discuss. What really has me worried is the fallout from the COVID-19, uh, how that's going to affect uh, our revenues, not only um, state level, but county, city level, what those numbers are going to look like. And uh, as the weeks proceed, we're going to have a better uh, outlook um, on the preceding months as to what those numbers may look like. So we've really got a lot uh, to consider. Uh, so we have our work cut out for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Lacey did an excellent job putting the information together and uh, it's interesting since December 2012 to March 2020 the collections totaled 14 million five hundred seventy five thousand nine hundred seventeen dollars you know that's staggering to think that that much is has come in with just a one cent sales tax. And the advantage we have is anyone coming through town helps support that. It's not just property owners, and we're not looking at property valuation, the fluctuation, but you know, even, even if sales tax reduced 15%, we're still looking at a sizable amount of money that it's putting it where it's going to do us the most good so that, and I don't know how many times, Kelly, we've had projects that come with the auditorium. Right before Niwala, we've got sound equipment that's antiquated that it's, okay, now where can we get the money? And, you know, the, the building is essential to a lot of activities and we've got to keep it and it's easy to use the sales tax money for that and, and the same with you know the swimming pool the the library uh, is is doing so much uh, to reach the the needs of the the citizens so I, I think with with planning we can utilize our, our sales tax in, the, in, the, in this one, one cent special use sales tax to provide a lot of tax relief and 
still make significant improvements to the quality of life of the citizens, which, you know, in, w in one sense, it, it all is a quality of life. If we're improving the streets, quality of life. If we're improving our, our buildings, quality of life. So, you know, it's taking a little concept that was focused on three buildings, but now let's expand it to citywide because, you know, assisting to getting in soccer fields and parking and restroom facilities for a sports complex for, for our kids and our grandkids, big impact of quality of life there. So, um, Kelly, you're going to have to keep track of our schedule so we can get this, and we need to have a work session that we can sit down and, and start brainstorming and commissioners make notes, you know, listen to the people, what they're thinking, how, how we can best serve them with the one cent sales tax to, to put to use. Uh, and, uh, and also, you know, there's ways that <clears throat> we're learning going through the, the pandemic here of what we need to operate the city you know, improvements we're gonna need there, ongoing supplies and things. So I think we have a much better opportunity now than we did 10 years ago. We've learned a lot. We're seeing a lot of things happen. So now let's just plan for the next 10 years. So any further comments on special use sales tax? I have none. I have none, Mayor, thank you. Okay. And Lacey, thank you for your, your work on that. And Dave, thank you both. Um, next item for discussion is the process for adopting the 2021 budget. Uh, we had a timeline given to us. I don't know if Lacey is there. Or Kelly, do you want to? Lacey, are you on the line? Yep, I'm here. How are you tonight, Lacey? I'm, I'm good. And thank you personally for your work on that. Do you want to kind of go through the preparation timeline for us? Sure, sure. Um, originally, I thought we were going to have to move quite a few things around, but but we're not as, as far behind as I thought we were. Um, really, the only change is the April special um, commission meeting was canceled. And so I've had to move the capital budget workshop to May 20th. Okay, so I see that. So that would be the plan for the, the special session will be to go over capital budget. And the departments are all working right now to um, go over their capital budgets and I should have time to, to review and give hopefully multiple scenarios to you all at that May 20th meeting. Okay, I I noticed in the sales tax there's uh, a slight decline in revenue and some articles I've seen where the, the governor's projecting shortfall in some tax collection and then also the cost of the pandem pandemic to the city now. Are you gonna have some information uh, for us on how that's going to impact the budget in 2021? I, I hope to. Um, kind of what I have been hearing from different organizations <laughs> that I subscribe to is, is that we don't know exactly yet, um, but I've been, been tuning in and, and keeping track, and I'm going to try and do a little bit of research to see um, if I can get an idea of the sectors, the breakdown of the different sectors that our sales tax comes from, that might be able to give me what I need to, to do some better projections so that I have a little bit more reliable number. Because, you know, yes, some places are, are down or completely closed, but others have picked up. But if we don't know what percentage those businesses make up our normal sales tax collections, I, I can't really predict 
what the change will be till I have that information. And tracking, tracking the costs that the pandemic's uh, cost us so far, you going to be able to get a report within a, a few weeks on that? Sure, I can give you, um, I can try and do that at the May 20th meeting as well. I can include kind of a, a two date. I, I'll probably cut it off, you know, sometime early May and give you cost to date. I can do that. I think uh, you had mentioned that so far, uh, or maybe it was Kelly, that capital projects have been put on hold and hiring has been frozen just so we'll see what this is going to do to the 2020 budget, but then also give an idea uh, going forward into the 2021 budget. So. Yes, it's, uh, they've been put on hold if they've not every, already been contracted for and any hiring if it's not safety related or affects being able to mm -hmm. operate um, our departments. So that's the guidance we're using. Okay. Commissioner's questions? I have none. Hey Lacey, this is Lewis. I have a question um, on the um, sales report for what we receive in May. When does that typically, typically come out? Um, I typically get the distribution report around the 24th through the 27th. Okay. So I, I should be receiving February sale numbers here in the next few days. With, and, with, but I, I won't get March numbers until after that May 20th meeting. Okay. That's, yeah, that was the one I was concerned with. That will actually uh, start showing um, the effects of COVID-19, the March sales uh, tax report, which will actually show up in May. There's a two-month two -month lag, and, right? And, and really, I anticipate that where we'll really start seeing them is June. Um, with the June sales tax report is when I, I anticipate actually seeing some of the effects. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions concerning the preparation timeline? Well, then we'll, while you're there, Lacey, we'll go to the sales tax report. So for the March report, that money was really collected in January? Okay. So, so yes, this report, uh, March 2020, shows sales collected in January, and um, we were down about uh, the 10.6 percent, um, but we were up over 12 percent in February. So, collections year to date are are still up. We've we have collected 26.8% of the budgeted amount, so still on track for the year as of March collections. So what will be reported in, in April, you know, May will be the first time we'll actually see the reduction from the pan pandemic. Uh, and and we may are, not even see it in that yeah. because, you know, they're with everyone kind of storming the Walmart and buying extra supplies and things, you know, right. we, we may actually even see a bit of a spike. But then I, I anticipate seeing a, a reduction in the June report. Right. Well, we need to keep an eye on it like you're doing. You're doing doing well. Uh, commissioners, any questions concerning the sales tax report? I have none. I have no further. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lacey. Thanks, Lacey. Okay, next item okay. under reports is thank the you. 2020 census update. Um, Mayor and commissioners, um, the stats as of a little, about an hour before the meeting is uh, independence was at 52.1%. Um, a little bit behind Kansas, which is at 56.6%. This is the amount of people responded. Uh, Caney's at 49.5, Cherryville 47.6, and Coffeyville 46.5. We had a, a city county meeting, uh, kind of through a teens meeting, like we've been um, doing this. Mm -hmm. And um, we challenged our other communities to a contest on who can have the highest collection rate because it's going to help all of us. So it's, um, they all agreed. And so um, right now we're beating them and we want to keep that up. So we want to encourage everybody to, um, who hasn't filled out their census to please fill it out. Um, we, you know, every household that we miss, you're talking about a lot of money lost to the community. And you take that times, you know, 20 households is, you know, was going to be what, about a half a million dollars. So mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, it's a lot of money and we're going to need it more than ever. And you don't get a do-over once this is done. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we want to encourage everybody to fill out their census. It's very important. And um, they're not tracking, they're not asking citizenship questions. So that's not anything to be, you know, concerned about on that. They're, uh, I believe they're sealed for 72 years. If anybody that works for the Census Bureau, you know, says anything about it, that's punishable by, um, fines and jail and all of that so it is protected information it you know when I filled mine out online took like seven minutes of that it's very easy to fill out so we would encourage everybody you can do it um, with your mobile phone you get a code on your postcard um, just go to the website enter that code in and and it just asks you questions you just click the answers and it's pretty easy to do okay Remind your neighbor, remind your family members that we need to get our census cards turned in. Great. And I will show, these are the three census tracts for independence. And as you can see, we have one that's kind of in the middle and the south uh, west that is, is rather low, 39.7. And I looked and it had a very low percentage of those that are utilizing the internet to fill it out. Mm -hmm where the other two census tracts had a high percentage of uh, people using the internet. Because you can call in, there's a phone number on the card as well. You don't have to do it online. Okay. Uh, you can call as well and, and fill it out. And they have people that speak different languages as well if that's what they need. Uh, so that is available as well. Is that uh, telephone number toll free for anyone who's using it? I believe so, yes. That's, um, it's on the postcard that they get. Okay, any other questions concerning the census report commission? I have none. I have none, Mayor. Okay, if that, we'll move on to city manager's comments. Kelly? Um, I put, there's a sales tax, tax report I put in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, the dumpster program, we modified it so that it's at the sanitation yard from eight to two, seven days a week. Um, because we were having an issue with dumpster diving and it's spilling out into the neighborhoods and we were getting some complaints. So uh, Mike had the idea that we'll just have them take it there. That way we've got security cameras and then we've got somebody down there and that seems to be working out very well. So that is going on. Um, another thing, we have gotten some comments on the uh, parking plan that was approved on February 6th, so I asked the police chief to, to kind of go through that with a timeline of how that occurred, and I gave copies to you on that. Chief? Evening. Evening, Chief. Good evening. Uh, you guys have the timeline in front of you. Would you, Mayor, would you like for me to go through that in detail for the folks watching at home? If you would. Okay. So on uh, July 13th last year, we got our first complaint regarding site triangle issues. The site triangle is uh, codified in city ordinance and it 
it, it dictates, it, it guides you through how to know how far back obstructions have to be trimmed from the street, from a corner in the street. So uh, for the folks that aren't aware of that on the, at home. So we got our first complaint of sight triangle issues and then stop signs in the area of 6th and Beach. And as you know, we don't like to chase dots on a map. We like to take a holistic approach to traffic safety. And so we went through there and we looked it over and you know, what can we do to have a solid pattern in this area that's predictable, that's safe? Um, and then that project was assigned to our traffic safety officer a couple days later. And about a month later, a proposal was submitted to me for stop signs to be placed in the neighborhood. And in September, early September, I requested that that be placed on the Traffic Safety Committee's Octoberly quarterly meeting. So the Traffic Safety Committee meets quarterly. We can convene them more often as needed. I didn't see this as being a major emergency at the time, so uh, it has been this way for the entire history that that neighborhood has existed, so I felt like we could just wait till their quarterly meeting to address it. So uh, in early October, we uh, utilized our pictometry to get all the mailing addresses for the homes in that area. And I believe we sent out 141 invites to residents in the affected area from Penn to Second and Oak down to Parkhurst. Uh, 100 and yeah, we included Second Street residences in that too, I, I believe. So, Anyhow, so we sent out 141 invites, giving, because as you know, we like to do these things with the, from a citizen's driven perspective versus what the police department thinks, because they're the ones that live there, they're the ones that are gonna have to live with it. So it was really important to us that we try to give people the opportunity to uh, speak to us. So on the 29th, we had that meeting, I had, I want to say two or three people respond either by email or by phone. And then I had about, I think we had five people sign the uh, roster for the SID Traffic Safety Committee meeting, uh, five neighbors, and one of those is here tonight. And when with meeting with those neighbors, they really liked the stop signs being placed in there. They thought that that would make them safer, particularly a lot of the driver obstructions in that area, you can't do anything with. They're a hillside or a huge tree or a, you know, a concrete wall, you know, so it's not like you could just fix those things. So the best thing to do there, most practical thing to do there is, is stop signs. So anyhow, uh, the suggestions that those citizens provided us was parking restricted to one side of the street on the north-south streets, a low bridge warning signs, being moved out closer to 75 or pin and uh, consequently it was determined that we needed to move them down to to 160 there on main and then uh, curbs they wanted the curbs to be painted yellow as well so we had the several additions there to the project so we went we ended up going back to the drawing board and beginning again to try to how do we include all these things that the citizens brought to to our attention, because we didn't think about those. Um, another concern that came in via letter and email was uh, one citizen was concerned about the bike lanes and the cost that that was to the city. Uh, I believe it was a pretty minimal cost and it made the traffic, made traffic safer in that area because it clearly indicates to traffic to utilize one lane there versus cars turning in front of a car coming up to pass them on the right or something thinking it's a four lane. Anyhow, um, another specific parking complaint was in the alleyway between Park and Second, where it hits Oak, there is a car that parks there or was parking there frequently, and it was um, the resident felt that it was a very dangerous situation for people trying to pull out of that alley onto Oak. And when I drove through there and looked at it, I said, this is a dangerous situation for people trying to pull out from this alley onto Oak. So uh, that was added in. 
And then, you know, similar complaints from that same citizen regarding parking complaints in the area and the danger of trying to pull out into the streets. So in uh, mid-November, I submitted a, pro I, I did some diagrams and submitted those to our traffic safety officer for his review. And I also submitted those to the street department director, uh, Mike Passour, so that he and I could visit on these. And as you know, when you bring more disciplines into a conversation, you start catching things are not as easy as you think they are, you know? And when you bring more disciplines to the conversation, you learn that it's a little more complicated than you thought. And there's some other things you need to consider as you move through a project. So early November, I uh, submitted those RCAs for the project to the interim city manager. They were returned for additional editing. So we kicked some things back and forth until we kind of landed on a final product toward the end of January. And then um, again in early December we, or early February, we made some slight modifications. What we did was we removed the yellow curb stripes from the RCA that we brought to you for the commission meeting. And the reason that we did that was because several reasons. Number one, I went through and surveyed the neighborhood and there are several places there where there is no curb. There's, for practical purposes, there's not a curb to paint. So it's not a reliable way to communicate, number one. Number two, it's a, highly, it's a high maintenance item that has to be continually maintained if you wanna enforce it. Uh, and the other thing was, we would have had to put down a tremendous amount of yellow striping on the curbs, which would have been very labor and expense in intensive. So we agreed that we'll just go with signage. We'll clearly communicate what's expected to the motoring public. So in early February, that final RCA appeared on the commission agenda. There was, I believe, two neighborhood residents present that night. One of them did speak to you, and that person was also uh, at <clears throat> the citizens meeting whenever and voiced her concerns at that meeting as well. And of course, the uh, commission approved that proposal as written on that date. Uh, on April 10th, we, as probably just about everyone in town is aware, we had a uh, tragic structure fire on the 1200 block of North 6th Street. And I was approached by the fire chief and given the situation, he was pretty exasperated. And I, we all were, it was just a tragic deal. And uh, you know, he looked at me and he said, Jerry, you gotta do something. That fire truck couldn't get down the street. They had to back up and hit it a second time and we didn't know if we were gonna be able to lay a hose with that tower truck down the street. Because, and I said, where at? And he showed me. And so when things calmed down, I walked up there and I looked at it and sure enough, there was a car parked on each side of the street. And I looked at that and I said, yeah, that probably would be difficult to get a tower truck down that street. So, um, you know, I went and back and told the fire chief, I said, look, this has already been approved and we're working on it. And so, um, around the 17th of April, the city crews went through and erected the signage and uh, the street department director and I went through the area, not together in the same car. We respect the Rona, hmm. but we did go through the area and survey what the workers were doing and make sure that it was true to the plan. And they followed the plan uh, exactly as it was approved. So beginning on the 17th of, I, I wanna say it was probably that Thursday or Friday, I believe that was the 17th. And I'm guessing that it didn't take long for commissioners and city staff to start hearing from residents in that area because that was the first day that I was notified that there was any uh, contention over what had been done. Uh, on the 21st, we heard some uh, third party, we addressed a third party, brought some concerns that they had been hearing about in their neighborhood. And then on the 22nd, of course, uh, we had a meeting with uh, one of the commissioners and, you know, to answer questions and kind of explain the situation and, and how do we want to address this moving forward. What's not on your timeline is this very afternoon, a buddy of mine uh, got a hold of me and, and gave me a little business, which is always pleasant. Uh, but my understanding is there may be a petition circling the neighborhood about 
the uh, off the uh, the the parking restrictions in the neighborhood. So I think you know the stop signs. Of course, no one's wound up about the stop signs. What what I did not do is go through the neighborhood and survey off street parking availability versus how much parking was being used. And that's probably something that I can include in the future. Uh, but you know, I don't. I know that I can't necessarily give you the secret to success, but I do know that the secret to failure is trying to please everyone. And um, I don't know, you know, that's, that's your decision as to how far should we take those kinds of things. Because the bottom line is that, you know, with the source documents from NACTO that I provided that, you know, on all of these kind of scenarios, all provide a recommendation for travel lane width and parking lane width, as you guys know. And uh, these streets certainly would fall into NACTO's recommendation that they be parking on one side. And they really, if you really go through that recommendation, if I recall right, they probably would not be parking. They would either be one way or no parking on either side. And I suppose that from a safe, from public safety perspective, which is, you know, what I'm always going to advocate for I don't I am not comfortable recommending that we take that parking we give that parking back simply because you know police cars can fit just about anywhere um, if you're not in a hurry but fire trucks certainly cannot and ambulances cannot and um, I just you, there are people I know in that neighborhood, and I'd like to think that we can get them the help as quickly as possible that they need. Uh, again, that's obviously not my final decision to make. That's just my position. Uh, but I also think that it would be wise to balance the citizens' concerns in that area. And um, I think maybe a potential, so the only solution that I've come up with in the last couple of hours since talking with my friend is uh, considering alternating one-way streets in the area, and then you could, I think, I don't even know that that would really go back to, to uh, fixing getting a fire truck down that street in an emergency. So it's a balancing act is what, what, what you have before you is a balancing act. Do you want to uh, let it sit as it is, or should we go back and change it? And uh, as, as a servant to the people, I am certainly willing to go back and do as you know, my authority comes from the people. So I am certainly willing to go back and do what, what the people need done. But I would tell the people that I'm always going to counsel them to err on the side of safety. Well, even if you had a one-way street, you still aren't alleviating the problem of enough width. That's correct. For an emergency, a large emergency vehicle to navigate the street if you had parking on both sides of the street because the, the problem isn't meeting ongoing traffic. It's having two vehicles parked adjacent to each other on opposite sides that now your path your clear travel path is too narrow so even if it was one way you'd still n need to have parking on one side of the street to allow the emergency vehicle to that, travel down the street and that's that's correct the only thing that making it a one way making those streets one way would do aside from probably being an irritant, which I would not like doing it. Uh, I think it would be irritating if, to me, just personally, one-way streets are a pain in the neck. Um, but the only thing it would do would be to make it safer for the motoring public. But you're correct, it would not do a thing to improve uh, safety. And the other thing that it also wouldn't do anything to improve would be pedestrian safety, which was a lot of the concern that we did hear about. Now, you had 141 mailers go out, so if there's 3.4 Americans in a household, then, you know, whatever the math is on that's about how many people live in that area. 
you had eight people show up. So, you know, the voice of the people was a very small percentage that was represented there. However, <clears throat> there's some kind of disconnect between picking your mail up and looking at your mail. And uh, I probably do the same thing on occasion, but uh, for whatever reason, um, from what we're hearing, nobody knew that they were notified. And I, I do know that there was at least eight people notified, so I can only imagine that the rest were notified as well. I certainly didn't pick out eight people to bring to the meeting. Jerry, as part of your analysis, did you, re, did you um, to calculate the total number of parking stalls that would remain available? No, I didn't, uh, other than to say that we cut it in half. <laughs> but I don't know what that number was, no, sir. And I did not go back and, and look at the neighborhood and assess off-street parking. And again, you know, it's a lesson learned for me. That's something I certainly will probably do in the future. And, but all it is is gonna, if, if I came to you with that number and I said, look, we're gonna cut parking in half and we're going to need to replace about 25% of it, I'm still gonna tell you, it's just another piece of information I'm gonna give you to make a decision with. Indeed, well, my follow-up question was then, did we do a vehicle count, maybe a snapshot vehicle count of parking spaces being utilized? Uh, on, either, in, on, on any of those streets prior to uh, taking it to the uh, traffic safety board? We did not, um, but again, I can tell you, I, you know, if you want to say specific numbers, no, but I can tell you that driving through that neighborhood, I said, man, there's a lot of parking on both sides of the street. So it was fairly heavily utilized on both sides of that street. Still, we don't have the data that suggests it was 50% or 80% utilized, or, or whether it was 20% utilized. I couldn't. We actually look at pictometry. We have pictometry, and we could count the vehicles of, that were parked on the date of, of that being taken. The problem that you're going to have there is most of your residential parking is going to happen at night. So, But even during the day, it, it would give you a snapshot of at least the working day. And I can tell you that I do my surveys in the daytime generally because that's when I'm at work. And uh, even during the day, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it was half utilized, but it's enough. And the problem is not so much utilization, but positioning. And so, you know, you could have three cars parked on a block, but if you've got two dualies parked right there to, on the, or even two cars parked across the street from each other, you, which is exactly what happened the day of that fire. There was, enough, there was enough people the morning of that. Of course, you know, we're in a different scenario right now because of the crisis that we're in, so a lot of people, more people are probably at home during the day right now. But there was enough traffic on that street that we had to do almost nothing to block traffic from coming down that street while, while the, uh, they were fighting that fire. It, it was tight. And even with the restrictions and uh, ordinances that we have, we do not limit the width of uh, vehicles parked other than the maximum width that's uh, dictated by the Department of Transportation, right? That's correct. And as a matter of fact, uh, it's probably in here, but there should have been a city ordinance that was given to you in the original RCA, and I believe that that width of the street is this of course you know the commission can do as the commission chooses but there is a city ordinance that says streets under 26 i believe it's 26 feet in width the commission can limit that to one side of the street parking and these most of these streets are right at 25.9 and 26 feet thank you chief um when you have Two cars parked uh, uh, directly adjacent from each other. Um, then, what is the footage in between the space that you have to navigate between those two parks if they're identically par or parked or adjacent, uh, directly across from each other? 
Are you, and with the street, if the street being 24 feet, would that's, those streets be 24 feet, the width? You know, I don't remember exactly what those streets were, so I'll just work from 26 feet. Okay. Just for sake of, discuss, just to speed the discussion along, if you like. Uh, if you park on both sides of that street, NACTO is going to tell you you need to have, I think, 7 to 9 or 7 to 11, something like that, feet of parking lane for each side of the street that you have parking on. Mm -hmm. So let's just say 8 feet. Okay. And uh, so you're taking 16 feet of lane out now of street width out from curb to curb. So now we're down to 10 feet of travel lane. So, I mean, just taking the emergency vehicle argument out. If you got a kid riding a bike and you're gonna pass them in your car on an eight foot travel lane, do you want your child doing that? I, I would probably stop and let the kid ride around and get to a spot where I could safely proceed. Um, I would not want to take that chance. So it's, it's, a, it's a tight fit. You know, it's, it's a tight fit. And um, I think maybe the best course of action is, uh, I bet you this time more than eight people will show up. And I would be happy if it's your request I would be happy to schedule another meeting with citizens and try to brainstorm a solution through this and see if we can't meet somewhere in the middle, uh, come up with some solutions that maybe that they can own that still serve the purposes of public safety. Now, I don't know if we can get there, but I'd certainly be willing to sit and listen. Jerry, it's my recollection that we have done this type of parking modification in other parts of town as well. We've done a number of them. I should have gone back through my records and looked at uh, my presentations to you, but uh, I can I can think of several offhand. Uh, we did some in that neighborhood between the high school and Penn, uh, north of Oak. We did one around the elementary school that I'm sure you guys recall. We made some changes there. Uh, we've we've had a few. Didn't we just recently do one on East Birch Street from Wald? Yes, we did. Th yeah. That was the one I remembered. Uh, I couldn't remember. Right about the didn't same go time. Back very far, but I remembered that one, and I remember uh, being at an event there where there were cars basically filling both sides of that block for about a block and a half, and <laughs> and it was you know you you couldn't just you know you had to be a little careful as you try to navigate uh, down between there because it is a narrow street. It is and. Some, some voices are heard more clearly than others. And um, sometimes those voices are right, and sometimes we need to sit and visit with, with some of those other voices and hear them out and see what we can work on together. But that, that neighborhood that you're talking about right there, if you recall, I took a picture. I, I drove my truck in between two other vehicles that were parked there and took a picture for the packet that was included so that we'd have a good, clear view and maybe mm -hmm. I should have done that with this proposal as well because it, that street's even narrower, if I recall right. It's a couple, three feet narrower. Um, that neighborhood's probably a little less densely populated. So, you know, most of the time, you know, the, the neighborhood over in the elementary school, that there was some pushback on that as well. And I went and visited with those people personally and, and we discussed it. and. Once they saw the entirety of the project, they, they said, well, I don't really like how it affects me, but I can understand how it affects the neighborhood. So, you know, they kind of um, are okay with it. And that could be the situation that we could work through here. I, I don't know, but I think it merits going back and taking some time to visit with the neighbors and invite them to a meeting so that we can do that. And I, again, if that's your recommendation, I'd certainly be what, certainly be happy to do it. And then maybe I could bring something back to you at a later date in a in this same forum. And then if if you wanted me to proceed on to a new proposal, we could work on that to be in a regular part of the meeting. Do you want to wait till you get an actual response?
from the neighbors if they really want to have a meeting. I mean, I guess I wasn't aware that you sent 141 letters out. Yes, sir, I did. <laughs> so um, I know we're willing to listen, to try and find alternate solutions, but um, if they, if the neighbors do want to have a meeting, then you're, what I hear you saying is that you're willing to meet with them, then I think they need to contact you to show that they are interested, not in a point, but just there has to be some point of reference from them, either an organizer that will get the word to them and come to you so you can work together. It, and that would show a little more organization to attempt a solution. But for you to go and try and organize a meeting, now you have no contact person. You, you don't know the type of response if the others are interested, but if, if the people, if they are doing a petition, which is, is good because it starts a point of contact now, then you, from there you could work for, okay. with a group to find resolve yeah, and, I, and see if there is a solution. Because I understand your concern um, of safety. You've had two structure fires that you had to have the tower utilized to extinguish the fire within two weeks of each other. No, I think it's, is it more than that? Is it three, two? Is it three houses? There's been, so, there's been enough. So I know what what you are seeing and your concerns are real that uh, you want to be able to get the service to protect the public. And one house, the, the way the older neighborhoods are developed, one house fire can spread to one on each side. They're very close together. So mm -hmm. I think your concern is sincere for protecting the public and we just need to see if there's a, a solution that we can come up with to satisfy parking needs and safety so i don't know i i think if if a individual from their group okay. would be a contact with you to start a dialogue and to organize them to come and, and sit and talk so that you can find a solution. Well, and I, I like that idea a lot better than mine anyways because 141 mailers is, you know, it's a significant expense. Yeah. And that's why, you know, we didn't, um, I didn't want to, I was going to have a second meeting, but I thought, you know, I, I don't know that it's wise to spend all that money again when eight people showed, or, you know, eight people contacted us. So we just contacted those same people and said, here's the plan and uh, if you have any questions please call us and you know we sent them yeah. the plan and we never heard back from those people so we just proceeded so yeah what's there a is there a saying of silence is consent that's how we viewed it yeah. and, and not you know that that's simple that's what you would naturally uh, take from silence is that they're in agreement with it and it's not a problem but you know, it, it is good that they called to voice their concern now, but let's see if they can work for a resolution and, and have a spokesman get with you. I don't know, that's my thought, Commission. It would be hard to organize a meeting of that size under our current restrictions, so it would be better for them to, if they have a community group of less than 10 that could uh, talk to you. We have to have a drive-in meeting in the Oval. <laughs> <laughs> and I can get on top of the tower truck. <laughs> yeah, Chief, I, I, think, I think that's fine. I'm, I'm in agreement with the, the two gentlemen mm -hmm. here on the commission. Also, you know, we, we serve the people. And, uh, you know, they, they vote us in and they vote us out. And we're, you know, we answer to them. So... Um, you know, if there's an organized group, then 
you know, it's, it's their opportunity now to come forward and they can get with you and, and then see if there's um, something that's agreeable, something that may be able to be worked out and, and, and to see how, see how far that goes, see if, if the, the possibility exists. But, but in the long run, you also have to look at the, the safety issue of it. And uh, in regards to equipment, none of the equipment that they're selling nowadays is getting any smaller. Uh, you know, fire trucks continually get bigger, heavier, longer. Um, I worked for a utility for 37 and a half years. Those line trucks continue to get bigger, heavier. You know, they busted up the concrete coming in and out of our drive at West Star because they got so heavy. Uh, we had to increase uh, the, 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 the height of the garage doors because they couldn't fit. We had to take out half the cement dock that the trucks would back up to to unload material. We didn't look to buy trucks that big, but that's what they were making, and that's what they were selling because the trucks yeah. were designed to do so much more work than the trucks in the past. So it's just the design, and that's what's available. So sometimes you just don't have an option as to, as to size. This is what it is, and, and this is what we need to accommodate the needs of the city, and that's what we go with. So. And we want to meet the needs of the neighborhood, too. Sure. So. There can be a, a solution of how access can be provided for emergency vehicles and parking to accommodate the needs of the neighborhood. So, yeah. Well, it's just an it's an opportunity to build bridges and be an ambassador to the to the citizens and build those relationships that we need, particularly as we struggle through this uh, crisis that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. We need to be finding more and more ways to work together. So this is just an opportunity, to, another opportunity mm -hmm. to do that. So I, I, I relish the opportunity. Uh, I'm glad for the feedback, and I hope they take me up on the yeah. chance to work together on a on a solution that better serves them. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chief Harrison. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that attitude. That's yeah. really, I think, positive for the city. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate your support. Thank you, Chief. Any other? Yeah, I, uh, we had a meeting with Trans Systems this week, and the Maine and Peter Pan white topping KDOT uh, C clip program. They did the pavement coring. The asphalt is not thick enough to allow for a six inch white topping, so the project will be a mill and overlay to the west city limits. And uh, we can apply for a concrete intersection and a future C clip, and it's anticipated to be bid midsummer. So I wanted to give you that update. Another update is the West Maple cost share uh, grant resubmittal has been uh, rescheduled to be due May 18th. Uh, we put out a um, call for letters of support and have had a wonderful response from that. And if anyone else wants to send a letter of support, we're still accepting those. Um, they did modify the project as recommended by the commission and remove the curb and gutter between 26th and Peter Pan, and this reduced the total project cost from $2,960,450 to $2,635,450. Uh, $2 so that modification was made at the recommendation of the commission. So we will be resubmitting that. Uh, with those additional uh, letters of support, which is one of the things that KDOT suggested that we do. Mm -hmm. And we got a really nice letter from Labette too on the access for that um, part of uh, the city for people going to the emergency room and things like that, that they can access that on the south side and, and then just come over uh, Maine to get to the um, ER. So that is actually part of the criteria that uh, KDOT uh, spe as far as being able to be awarded this money uh, would enhance our chances mm -hmm. of getting that because the, the original one um, we were turned down. Yes. So we're going to resubmit this. So these letters of support will show them that uh, this is tied to economic development in that particular area. Yes. And it increases our chances of maybe this time around 
Hopefully. receiving that grant. And we got letters not only for businesses, but some individuals as well. So I was really pleased to see that. So I just wanted to let you know that. And then also just um, our employees have been really good through this whole COVID thing. Uh, we made some posters that we're putting up in the different departments. And I'll read that to you. It says, thank you for being a City of Indy hero. We gratefully acknowledge and applaud your extra efforts and flexibility to help protect the health of our community during the unprecedented COVID-19 crisis. Thank you for your cooperation, creativity, and positivity. And thank you for being a valued member of the City of Independence team. And I, it's just a reminder that we appreciate our employees and what they're doing. And so, and we also, uh, some of our organizations we're working with, we, we also um, are providing these posters to them. Uh, Labette Health, uh, Main Street Chamber, um, the USD, things like that too. Just trying to get some positive information and thank yous out to those people that are really working hard through this crisis. That's good. We appreciate all the, the, the employees. And that's all I have, okay. Mayor. Uh, commissioner comments? I have none. I have none, Mayor. Okay, I, the only comment I had was regarding the financial effect on the city budget from the pandemic, and we discussed that earlier. So with that, we'll go to public concerns. There were... There's someone here, but I, I don't know if we had the cards out. So. Okay. 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 We had no public concerns. Um, executive session for the purpose of reviewing and considering city manager applications. And with that, I move that we recess for an executive session for review and discussion of city manager applications pursuant to the non-elected personnel exception, KSA 754319B1. The meeting will resume at uh, 752 in the Civic Center. So that the motion, do I have a second? Second. Motion and second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And during this time, uh, do you want to? Yeah, David's going to give a, a COVID update. And if anyone has questions, they can send them to us on Facebook related to the, the COVID pandemic. And we'll just do a, a Q&A during that time. OK, great. our uh, code and safety uh, director. He's also our emergency manager for independence, and he will be giving you an update on the COVID situation. If you would like to send us questions, you can do that on Facebook Live, and we'll, we'll answer them for the uh, few minutes that we have here. Go ahead, David. Thank you. Good evening. The current city of independence continues to be on a stay-at-home order that was issued by the governor of Kansas which I believe expires May 3rd. Uh, the governor of Kansas is currently working on the phases for Kansas as she takes into account the president's phase, phases that he has put out. She anticipates to release next week. Uh, we anticipate maybe Thursday what those phases will look like for Kansas. Uh, the state of Kansas continues to work at this time to put together their surveillance and testing procedures, which must be in place prior to Kansas starting the phasing of the uh, plan. Uh, currently in the city of Independence, we continue to work hard to, uh, with our social distancing, encouraging hand washing, and uh, we continue to encourage people to support our local businesses through takeout, and uh, drive-through 
and prepare for the upcoming uh, beginning of opening back up the city of independence. Uh, we too are anxious to see what those results will be, uh, how the governor will take this approach. Uh, we realize in western Kansas there are counties that have absolutely zero COVID positive patients which may open up quicker whereas on the eastern part of Kansas and in southeast Kansas we do have cases of COVID in our areas so how we will all phase through those phases may be different depending on where you are at some of the concerns as the state of kansas opens up is as people begin to travel uh, the, the potential spread of covid as businesses begin to open back up people coming into businesses or workers working closely together so we anticipate a lot of these rules will be about social distancing, hand washing, setting up workstations at work, uh, whether some businesses are able to do uh, working off premises or setting up their workstations to follow those guidelines to help the spread. Uh, the communities will work very hard if a COVID patient does come positive during that time to do what we call surveillance. Surveillance is where we work with the patient to figure out who they've been in close contact with recently and working to isolate that to stop the spread of the COVID uh, transmission from people to people. So there's a lot of things happening, a lot of preparation being put in place to open back up the community. And uh, do we have any questions? Uh, banning fireworks, but that's something that wouldn't be part of this um, discussion. Right. I mean, it is a part of a discussion as far as, you know, as we talk about July 4th and what will the state of the country be like or Kansas, and but, but we won't know that for... And the current ordinance specifies certain dates and times around the 4th where uh, fireworks are allowed. Yeah. And at this time, there hasn't been any discussion about banning those at this time right yeah and then somebody else had a question on a water bill and if you call uh, City Hall 332-2500 um, option 3 you can check on the status of your water bill yes and I don't see any others you have any other information to add no, I just continue to encourage people to watch our different uh, web pages that we have put together. There is a lot of great information. There's a lot of great messaging. Uh, there's several different people in town that have taken time to put together messages. Uh, this Saturday is Love Independence. While we encourage social distancing, no grouping greater than 10, uh, we're asking people to to consider whether that's sending a note to somebody uh, maybe you go uh, your love is going to a local restaurant and picking up food you know shoot those uh, Facebook photos uh, send them to the chamber send them to the city you know we have a great community we have a loving community a community that see that always responds in the time of need and uh, we're all saddened that we cannot uh, take the eight or nine houses this year that was planned to be painted and do the love independence that we were going to do. But I know those days will return shortly and we'll be able to accomplish those tasks. So remember love independence. Uh, we also encourage people, this is our what we call our quick win project with our beautification committee. Uh, we have opened up the sanitation yard, which has worked excellent from 8 to 2, it's 2 p.m., isn't it, Kelly? Yeah. 8 to 2 daily, you can take your uh, trash to the sanitation yard, uh, clean up your yard, clean out your garage, or whatever you need to do during this stay-at-home order. Take, that, take those items down to the sanitation yard. Uh, you'll be directed but to the back side where you can unload that, and we will take care of that. Uh, they, are, they also are taking tires. Uh, we do recycle on Tuesdays from 11 to 
one, to one. 11 yeah. to 1. Uh, so remember, Recycle Day on Tuesdays. Uh, we are hoping that June 1st we'll be able to open back up Recycle on the first Saturday of the month. Uh, we're, again, watching the social distancing and all the rules, and we want to make it safe for our employees to be able to do that again, but we're looking for a June 1st. Uh, we're also anxious to get our beautification committee back up and going. Uh, we're anxious to where we can have the meeting with the community and get more community involvement in beautification of independence. So hopefully maybe this fall we'll be able to have those meetings and get some involvement and get your ideas on beautification of independence. Uh, we have a lot of different projects that COVID-19 has really slowed us down at to accomplish this year, but we're looking forward to getting these projects back up and going. Uh, there's the 150th anniversary, Kelly, that's coming up in July. I know we've kind of, there are I, there are projects planned for the 150th anniversary, but they've kind of been put on hold. I believe it's the museum that's doing a lot of this planning, and uh, they're waiting to see what the social distancing and the rules will be at that time for that celebration that is going on. Um, what other items do we have in the city? We have a newsletter coming out. Yes. Um, that will be coming out, hopefully uh, be mailed out on Monday or Tuesday. Yes. And it's a special edition. It has a lot of tips in it uh, related to the, the COVID-19. It has resources if you need uh, food assistance, um, if you need uh, help, uh, having somebody go to the grocery store for you or get medications for you those resources are in there we also have a, a shop local dining and a retail guide in there and we also have a section that was sponsored by the usd honoring our seniors and then there's also some mental health tips in there as well so be watching your mailboxes for that that shall be coming out uh, next week early next week hopefully Yes, that will be, uh, I think it's a very helpful newsletter and for a great time. And I see our commissioners coming back, so we'll. <laughs> We're back in session and there's no action taken from executive session. So the next item is adjournment. So I make a motion that we adjourn. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried.